Hi, I'm Rona Sharp and this is a short resource for program development teams at Oxford Brookes University. So I wanted to start them with some feedback that's been given recently to program teams as they've arrived at validation or periodic review. And I've got some quotes here from validation and periodic review documentation which has come through to AESC. And it's surprising how much of the feedback is related to the construction and articulation of particularly program level learning outcomes. So th these are just five reports that happened to come to an AESC meeting that I was at this week. This is the April 2013 AESC meeting, if you want to follow up where I got these from. And you can see that there are a number of things which the validation panels are looking for when they're looking at the program team's documentation in terms of their learning outcomes. So we'll just go through these one at a time because I think they're quite interesting and they will, uh, they will lead us to things which I want to talk about, particularly in this short resource. So panel chairs are looking at things like constructive alignment of the assessment tasks of the module outcomes. They're looking at the number of program learning outcomes and in this case there were 24 and thinking well that's probably a few too many. They're looking at the mapping of the learning outcomes to the level of the award and they're looking at making sure that all of the graduate attributes are explicitly in the learning outcomes and you can see how students will have the opportunity to acquire and demonstrate their achievement of those graduate attributes. So for program development teams this is something they need to be aware of that validation and periodic review panel chairs are, are looking carefully now at the way that learning outcomes have been articulated. What are they looking for? Well, learning outcomes are quite tricky really because on the one hand you've simply got to express what students are able to do at the end of the programme and uh, we should be able to do that through our course design work but particularly in programme specification documents which are becoming more for an external audience we've also got to do that in ways that are meaningful to a large number of audiences, prospective as well as current students, um, other teaching staff who might be teaching this programme either here or in a collaborative partner, and employers and professional bodies will also have an interest in learning outcomes. So I think this is quite tricky to not just express to students what they're expected to be able to do, but also meet the needs of all these other audiences. So uh, uh, this is something that we need to take particular care over. Just a quick refresher then before we go into the technicalities and some advice on, on how you write learning outcomes about why we're bothering to do this at all. We used to spend quite a lot of time, particularly on the new lecturers course for example, debating the purpose of learning outcomes at all. There seems to be fair agreement now in HE but it hasn't always been so. The outcomes based approach to uh, course design, particularly in higher education, was largely a response to requirements which began in the late 90s I suppose and triggered by the Deering report for higher education to demonstrate how it assured the quality and the standards of its graduates and obviously we've come quite a long way since then. But it was really about defining knowledge and skills. Could we clearly articulate, could higher education institutions clearly articulate the knowledge and skills which their graduates would be able to demonstrate? Now this outcomes based approach built on the behavioural objectives that have been used by educationists in the, in the 50s and 60s onwards, but took it to another level really, to also clarify the purpose of the course for people who might have an interest in that, and make visible the achievements of the graduates of the course. Learning outcomes then should enable graduates to be able to speak to employers about the attributes that they've gained while they've been studying to help the students find the right course that they want to do and help employers find the right student or graduate from the course. There's another set of things though as well over on the, the right hand side of this picture which are important reasons why we have continued to use learning outcomes for the last 20 years or so. In terms of us as teachers Focusing on learning outcomes, particularly in early stages of course design, can help us decide on the priorities of what we want to teach, can help us choose appropriate teaching strategies, and it can be increasingly important help us to design purposeful assessment tasks. So I guess really you, you've got two main groups of 
reasons why we are still persisting with learning outcomes. The ones on the left hand side which are largely about making explicit what graduates can do and making visible what graduates can do. And the other practical things to help teachers both in, in lesson and session design but also in programme level design help them make choices about what it is they teach. And you notice that those ones all down the right hand side are largely the components of an aligned curriculum and this you will remember was one of the things that the panel chairs said they were looking for. Deciding on the priorities, what goes into your learning outcomes, aligning that with teaching methods, teaching and learning strategies and aligning that with purposeful assessments. So it's a fairly familiar picture here of what an aligned curriculum might look like where we're looking at the desired or expected or hoped for outcomes and the kinds of learning activities that students might need to engage in in order that they behave in ways that are likely to achieve those outcomes. And then thirdly the kind of assessment tasks that would give us the feedback that we need about whether the actual outcomes that the students are able to demonstrate match those that we had intended for them. There are of course and have been criticisms of the learning outcomes or the outcomes based approach to education which are worth mentioning here. Um, where the learning outcomes approach is directive and explicit, um, not all learning is and the learning outcomes approach has been criticised for being reductionist for example, particularly when learning outcomes are, are written at lower cognitive levels, that it is too easy to focus on knowledge-based outcomes and neglect learning outcomes which are more difficult to express, such as those which are to do with attitudes and values and motivations and interests and things that might be particularly important to professional and statutory bodies. Or indeed that by pre-setting learning outcomes, we actually limit the unexpected, unanticipated outcomes of learning, which might be just as valuable to students. And certainly we used to hear a lot about the intrusion of learning outcomes into university autonomy by having to be explicit and by sharing publicly what it is we expected our graduates to achieve. And, and there is still some argument that perhaps it's okay for learning to be difficult and confusing and for students to define their own paths in that uh, a bit more carefully. So learning outcomes, or if you prefer then, expected or hoped for or anticipated learning outcomes to uh, allow for the fact that some learning outcomes may be unexpected and unanticipated. What should learning outcomes in the way that we define them there do? Learning outcomes should be an expression of what a student should be able to do at the end of a module or a programme. And, and the doing bit is important. Outcomes are the demonstrable behaviour resulting from student learning. They're, they are the ways that the, the learner can show us that they have to demonstrate to us what it is that they have learned. So uh, outcomes that, that students will understand a given topic, for example, aren't particularly helpful. What we need to do is to try and write down how students can demonstrate to us that they understand a particular topic. So learning outcomes might describe the kinds of knowledge that students are able to employ and going on from that the kind of problems that they're able to solve, the kinds of skills they'll be able to use and the conditions in which they'll be able to demonstrate the knowledge and the skills that they have and the problems that they'll be able to solve. And of course and we've talked about this already some indication of the level of their performance should be expected. So I'm, I'm really just trying to give you a bit of a, a tool here that you can use to help you construct learning outcomes. It's not the complete answer, it's a starting point. So for example, we might have a learning outcome which is to analyse. The object might be data. What we want people to analyse is the data. And then the third one, the context or the conditions under which this can happen is I want people to analyse data using a wide range of techniques. Or I want them to analyse data um, largely independently or without supervision or some kind of condition which sets that there. Uh, uh, the hard bit, well I guess there are two hobbits, the, the first one that we very often see learning outcomes which have missed off the context, so we often see learning outcomes that only consist of verb and object, and the other thing is uh, choice of verb is very important because that is what the students are able to do 
with the knowledge and the skills and the attributes, the attitudes that they have acquired while they're with us. So that's the bit that makes the outcome of learning demonstrable. The verb is important. Now, many of you will know already that there are a couple of um, published taxonomies or classifications of verbs to help you pick verbs, particularly if English isn't your first or second language. There's big solo taxonomy, Bloom's classification of learning objectives. I'm not going to repeat those here. You can Google them and find a million different examples of them. But having ordered, classified lists of verbs to choose from, I think, is quite helpful. So, what are panels looking for in your learning outcomes? At a basic level, they're looking for well-constructed learning outcomes, both at the module and the programme level, which have that verb object context. That's the easy bit. Programme learning outcomes are something a bit more complicated on their own and worth spending just another few minutes thinking about. The programme learning outcomes are often the ones which are visible to an external audience. So these are the ones which we hope will be able to express what students are expected to be able to achieve by the end of the programme in meaningful ways to all of these different audiences. So that's one thing that makes programme learning outcomes a little bit harder to write. The second thing is that programme learning outcomes should not just be a consolidated list of all the module learning outcomes, there would be too many anyway, but in some way they demonstrate the integration of the learning from all of the different modules. And then now, of course, we need our programme learning outcomes to articulate the Brooks graduate or postgraduate or foundation degree attributes and contextualise them, contextualise those attributes for the discipline. So I'm just pulling up a web browser here and I'm going to Google uh, graduate attributes in action. And you see the, the top hit there is the graduate attributes in action Brooks wiki. And these are a whole collection of resources which are available to program development teams to think about, to help them think about how to make the graduate attributes meaningful within the context of your program. So for example, if we go to research literacy, you can see the case studies there that we collected a couple of years ago of what research literacy might look like within the context of three different courses or, or learning settings here. And then you can see these new bits that we've added, which are examples of research literacy uh, within the disciplines. And I'm just going to click on one of these and you can see that it pulls up a, wor a Word document. And what you've got here is examples which have been pulled out of all the programme specifications that were revised last year. So this, these examples um, are all real. They've all been produced by programme teams last year. And I hope that they'll be useful to prog following programme development teams who are writing their own learning outcomes. We've also just got some lists of what people thought it meant, particularly to be uh, starting off here a critical consumer of research at the undergraduate level. We'll, we'll add more postgraduate level ones as we do them. And these uh, selection of 14 ones here are ones that I thought were particularly well articulated when I was reading through all of the programme learning outcomes. So they're quite good ones to look at and defined differently within each of the disciplines. So just to finish, I've put a couple of additional resources up here which you might like to look at at your leisure. Uh, the first of which is just a web page on the OCSLD website on writing learning outcomes, which was produced by um, Jude Carroll, gosh, about 10 years ago, but uh, it's still extremely useful, practical help on writing learning outcomes. And more recently, David Baum's writing and using good learning outcomes, which was produced for Leeds Metropolitan University. It's a little uh, print-based booklet, which you can download and have a look at yourself to guide through people through the process of writing learning outcomes. So I hope you find at least some of those useful.